اهلا بكم مشاهدينا وحلقه جديده من برنامج كاميرا العكاريه Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, nice to see so many of you, you back. I uh, hope you enjoyed yesterday. Today we have a slightly shorter day, uh, but that doesn't make it any less important. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce our opening speaker, interviewee, um, Tariq Kabil, is uh, Minister of Trade and Industry, of course, for Egypt. Um, he comes into that role in government uh, after an extensive private sector career Um, working not only in Egypt but in, in Saudi Arabia and the United States uh, with um, Procter and Gamble, with Pepsi Cola, of course led the first successful privatization in Egypt back in the mid 90s, uh, times we all remember, I certainly do, and then latterly worked for a, a little while in private equity before joining the government. Welcome to the Euro Money Conference, Minister. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Some very kind of obvious questions and themes which we've been talking about yesterday and which we'll continue to talk about today and we're very, very keen to have your take on that as Minister of Trade and Industry. Um, in the interview we did yesterday with the Minister of Finance, we talked of course about the IMF program, about the IMF deal, um, and one, the, the kind of, one extremely important aspect to that story, it seems to me, is that here you have a reform-minded government and we keep having to sort of press uh, the government, well, is it for real this time, and you'll talk to us a bit about that, who's come up with a program which then fits in to a kind of external framework, an inter external benchmarking protocol, which is an IMF program. So the important thing is that this is not something imposed by the IMF on a country. It's something which the country has asked the IMF to help structure and, f and form a framework. Is that how you see it? Uh, first of all, the government plan has been developed uh, back in uh, November, December last year, has been presented to the parliament in January of this year, and it has all the elements of the reform. So the IMF uh, uh, didn't add anything to the program. It's a 100% Egyptian program developed by the government, presented to the parliament, approved by the parliament, and that's what we're working on. The IMF is, uh, is important from two aspects. One is the vote of confidence on the Egyptian economy and will help attract more funding. The second is obviously the value of the, the program itself. And how does it, how, what impact does it have specifically on trade? It has obviously uh, trade and industry, I would say. First, I mean, it has a direct and indirect uh, impact. One of the biggest issues we're having today is forex uh, differential pricing between the official price and uh, the free market. Second is availability of dollars. So IMF definitely will help to sort of stabilize that platform. Second, it has a direct impact on industry. Uh, once you have that stability, their industry will operate in a full capacity stream. Uh, obviously, if and when devaluation will happen, will definitely help the trade on both sides, on importation, limiting importation, as well as boosting export. We expect, it depends on how it would happen and when it would happen, it could boost export in the neighborhood of uh, 10%. So I mean, clearly it does affect both sides of that and helps to, to rebalance it in a, in a kind of technical sense. But let's, let's go back to more the very practical sense. I mean, we talked on this stage yesterday about, of course, about the FX question, about the, the exchange rate. And there's two slightly different things, because the exchange rate is one thing. And then there is the simple practical question of whatever the exchange rate may be, whether you're operating at the official or the unofficial level, it is the simple availability of currency. 
Uh, and that clearly affects investment flows, investment decisions, but even more so, it affects trade. So, in very practical terms, what do you see as the next step to solving that FX availability problem? Whether there's a devaluation, whether there's a free float, whether it's a part, however that policy is engineered by the central bank, in very practical terms, the simple availability of FX is a real problem for trade. So how do you address that? I think, first of all, I'm sure that the central bank has a plan to address that. And I think it's the chicken or the egg approach. Uh, let's talk availability. Uh, availability, you have today uh, five areas which uh, impact uh, forex availability. Suez Canal, which is growing at the rate of 4% because of the uh, slowdown in the global trade. You have tourism, which is quite down now for the obvious reasons. You have the money transfer from Egyptian abroad, which is impacted by the differential price between the actual and the uh, free market. You have the investment and you have the trade balance. Those are the five factors. Three of them linked to uh, forex and partially linked to availability. So let's talk investment, for example. If any investor wants to come, he look at Obviously, political stability, which we have now, uh, since His Highness of the CC uh, was elected. So we have a stable market. They look at economy, stability, including forex and availability, which we're working on. It should be uh, solved soon. They look at attractive investment law, which uh, I know that the Minister of Investment is working on that to have an attractive investment law because we're not competing alone. We're competing with neighbor countries, we're competing with, uh, with uh, many institutions to where the investment would go. Uh, and they also look at the ease of doing business, which is something we're working uh, quite hard. We've done a lot, we still have a lot in the pipeline. So uh, investment is a key element when it comes to forex availability. So once you fix the differential price and you have a proper investment law and we improve the ease of doing business, we expect investment to come back in full stream. I know people kind of like waiting, which will eventually impact industry as well as trade. But right now, companies are hurting. Companies that import goods, for example, even fairly small retail companies that, import, that need to import goods in order to do their business, those companies are hurting. Is there, a, is there something immediately that can be done to alleviate that difficulty? The solution is industry, is not trade. For the next period, we need to focus on boosting the industry to fill that gap of the trade. Let me tell you an example. Since January, I mean, if you look at last year on the trade balance, importation non-oil, was about 67 billion and export was about 18 billion. So export dropped uh, from 2014 to 2015. So you're talking about a gap of 49 billion. Since January, importation went down by 7 billion, export went up by 1 billion. However, what also you need to understand is why export didn't grow a lot faster. First, industry takes time to grow. Two, industry are filling the gap. Those seven million dollars, uh, billions of consumption used to happen here. So industry are filling that gap. Yes, there is a little bit of instability which uh, will be fixed soon once we fix the financial uh, situation. I notice that before we leave the question of, of the currency and Forex, I notice that you use the expression a free market rate uh, others would call that a black market rate. I don't like that. No. And, I, and the vocabulary, it seems to me, is significant and interesting. Free market rate. Free always sounds like something good, right? Yeah. Whether it's freedom or, you know, free drinks for the workers. It's good. So may, might, I don't wish to put words into your mouth, but might I take from that 
that you regard a free-floating currency as ultimately a good thing? On the long term, yes. I mean, eventually, that's what will happen. And are you, are you obviously, you're not running the central bank. Correct. <laughs> But, and, and one always has Thank the same sort of conversation with government people apropos of the central bank. But are you prepared to put some sort of time scale on that? I mean, is it before the next elections? Uh, that's it? definitely not my decision. There's a lot of elements comes to that. And uh, I'm sure when everything comes into place, that a decision will be taken. By the time the next Euro Money Conference takes place in September next year, is it possible that we would see a free-floating Egyptian pound? I hope so. Good. Thank you. I will press you no further, sir. I'd like to step back a little bit from, from Egypt and your specific portfolio, but look at trade in a more global sense. The OECD published a study earlier this year. Well, it wasn't a, you know, the figures are there for anybody to see, but they've highlighted the point that for the first time, maybe not ever, but certainly in modern history, the level of growth in global trade is outstripped by the level of growth in global GDP. And that is a very, very strange anomaly, that economic activity in the round is growing faster than trade, and that's the first time it's happened. That's potentially very, very a very bearish signal for the global economy. At the same time, you have lots of talk of protectionism coming <coughs> with the United States. The United States has always portrayed itself as a beacon of free trade, but of course never truly has been so. Um, the European Union, of course, is, is kind of frank. There's lots of difficulties of that kind of end. What's your view on those very big picture questions, and does it worry you? Uh, on the short term, no, it doesn't worry me, because we have a lot to do internally before we talk externally. That topic was talked in the G20 uh, for the trade ministers in China. Global trade went down from almost 8% to 25 to 3%. Uh, the G20 talked about a lot of activities to uh, boost capacity internally, and then obviously the uh, uh, global trade. It will, in my view, it will take a minimum of one and a half to two years to start picking up. So there's a lot of incentive to uh, boost SMEs and industrial capacity in, in most of the countries, specifically focusing on, on Africa. Uh, would that have a significant impact on, on Egypt? Uh, uh, yes and no. To a large extent, no. The concern when you have an incremental capacity out there, you will have some dumping in which we are trying to protect. I mean, we're seeing that in steel industry and many other industries. So that level of protection is needed. Absolute protection is not needed because at the end of the day, you need to have a competitive activities within every country in order to improve quality and reduce cost because at the end of the day, consumer is the ultimate judge to that. But you mentioned China, and of course China is, you know, is a great dumper. Steel is a, is a is a good example, and of course the Americans have have protectionist barriers, if you want to call them that, against that kind of thing. The UK and famously no, does not. No. Sure, but China has a significant economic problem in that it has been reliant on exports to generate super fast growth to continue to generate employment and blah, blah, blah. It is clearly having trouble keeping up with the growth rate it wants. So in order to justify the existence of all those steel plants, the product of which basically goes on vendor finance to build more steel plants, is to dump steel into global markets. So that is almost guaranteeing that protectionism will increase. Do you agree with that as a macro point? In some sectors, yes. And if that is, if there are these strong impulses and potentially political impulses of the same kind coming from the US, is there any hope for, 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 for global free trade? Global free trade will continue with some reservations. Let me comment on China. China grows slowing down. 
which is actually creating some of the problems you said. But they're changing their approach into what you call uh, global China. So they're moving some manufacturing facilities and some sectors outside China. Uh, specifically, for example, textile. So they're moving textile to Vietnam, to uh, uh, Thailand, to Ethiopia, and we're working to attract them into Egypt. So they're moving some of the excess capacity outside uh, China. Uh, steel will be hard. Uh, that will continue to have some level of protections based on how serious is the dumping. Let's switch back to Egypt. Export strategy. Africa, Middle East, wider sort of concentric circles. Paint, paint us the picture of the export strategy in terms of industry and destinations. Uh, export is the future hope of Egypt. That's something we need to uh, understand because we cannot live with the current trade deficit. Fact. Uh, it's quite difficult to talk about export in a total of level. We need to talk export in terms of areas and in terms of sectors. So despite the fact that EU is the biggest trade partner, it's about 31% of our export, which will continue to work on and grow, our absolute focus will be Africa, and uh, number two will be the Arab League. Uh, why Africa? Because we have a, a very strong competitive edge in many sectors, textile, building materials, chemicals, engineering, and so forth. So there is a clear focus on Africa when it comes to uh, export. Um, what we're doing, we're, 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 we have a lot of plans, partially, partially have been implemented. We created, for example, a company between Egyptian businessmen uh, representing different sectors and Lebanese who are living in Africa. Uh, why Lebanese? Because they're, first of all, they've been living there for quite some time, particularly in West Africa. Basically, every African country you go to, you find Lebanese businessmen running the best restaurant, the hotel, Good. the best nightclub. So they're quite strong in marketing, yeah. quite strong in sales. This company has been created like four months ago. We've already had the first four shipments uh, went there. Uh, number two, we next month we'll open the first logistics center in Kenya. Right. Uh, three, we are negotiating as we speak with a direct shipping line between Egypt and Kenya, East Africa, and then will be followed by West Africa and another line for you. So this is, is uh, been going on. Also, we have commercial representatives across uh, many countries of the globe. First, we've restructured that, we've cut down like 13 offices, but we open five offices in Africa. So, we open in Djibouti, we open in Tanzania, in Ghana, in Côte d'Ivoire, in another country. Uh, with, we've also developed a very clear KPIs for the performance of those uh, commercial representatives. Uh, primarily two things. Number one, export. Egyptian export, so a clear comparison with a specific number country by country, number two investment, because that is the role of why they're there. Uh, if you look at also on a, on a global expanding our exhibitions, globally this is something very, very important. We've done last year, for example, 72 exhibitions across the focused countries to uh, uh, present the Egyptian product and Egyptian companies. Uh, and we've done uh, a lot locally, uh, domestically, international exhibitions as well, uh, domestically. Uh, another uh, point, which is... Could we just stick with Africa for, for, for a moment? I'm still talking about Africa. Okay, so I was going to ask for some numbers. Okay. Uh, go ahead. As in, where we, are, where we are now in terms of Egyptian exports to Africa taken in the round, and what the target is. I mean, you say you put in KPIs, so there's a target, there's a budget. Sure. Uh, we're looking, first of all, what we, we export today to Comesa countries, for example, is about in the neighborhood of 2 billion. Total Africa is about 4 billion. 
uh, we're looking on a global basis to increase about 10%, with Africa is about 15%. Okay. Uh, coming back to the strategy of export as well, uh, uh, we talked about Africa in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, one of the important elements which we're working locally but it has a direct impact on export is splitting subsidy from industry. Let me give you another specific example, I mean fertilizers industry. Fertilizers industry used to uh, suffer a lot from mixing the subsidy which we give to farmers with with the manufacturing facilities. So examples, they were not allowed to sell locally, they're not allowed to export except with a permission, so they're kind of like capped. We've already worked and implemented that, so we link gas prices to uh, uh, global urea prices. We allow them to sell locally and export without uh, a permission while protecting the subsidy directly to the farmers. If you look at the results just last month alone, fertilizers went from 190 million dollars uh, in, in 190 million in 2014. In 2015, last month was about 470 uh, uh, million. So we're seeing a significant improve from, uh, improvement from that split. Another important aspect is working on the supply chain gaps on specific sectors. Let me give an example on textile, for example. Textile, uh, we export about overall about 3, 3.1 billion. Uh, Egypt, for example, is the fourth biggest supply to the US for jeans. If you look at the manufacturing of jeans, we have, we have the entire supply chain with, with the exception of the coloring or dyeing. Uh, that we have only 30% capacity. So we manufacture textile, we send it abroad to be dyed and back. And that makes the industry incompatible, not competitive. So bringing one of the biggest companies to invest directly in order to fill that gap. So filling some of those, we're doing the same in automotive as well. And that is a live project. That's that is a live project that has been discussed in China. There is active work going on as we speak. Okay. So filling those gaps are very, very important. Another important point is, is the, what you call the marketing support for exporters. First of all, we've doubled that fund, but we've also changed the system to allow wider base of a, a small exporters uh, with a focus on how deep is the localization of that particular province. So the support would go high, uh, directly linked to the percentage of the Egyptian product in the, in the finished goods. There's a lot going on when it comes to export. We're also restructuring part of the ministry to have to create what you call the export development entity because export is kind of like split in, in so many ways. So we have a complete export development entity including marketing fund, including all the type of support. Let's talk a little bit. I, I want to come back. Is, is that the is that the so-called SME entity? Was that something separate? No, it's okay. Separate. Well, we're going to come back to that anyway. But first of all, I want to ask you a bit about the ease of doing business. You know, a, a, a phrase that always trips easily off the tongue in in all of these conversations. But it means so many things, and of course, it means different things to different people. But clearly, bureaucracy, government bureaucracy, layers of bureaucracy. This is something which is, this battle has been being fought, well, forever, essentially, but, and, and always good intentions are declared, but what, what steps are you taking practically to try to simply do away with layers of bureaucracy, to, to lessen the burden on businesses of all kinds, whether domestic or foreign, so that they can get on with what they're really trying to do? Sure. First of all, I was in the other camp, so understand exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> what you want and what the business people want. Number two is, is a, a very important for uh, FDIs. We have done a lot in that particular area and we have a lot on the pipeline. Let me give a specific example. Uh, industrial licensing. Uh, if you talk about the existing law, which is actually from 1958, uh, we treat licensing 
we treat the uh, industry small, very small, equal to the very large industry with all the requirements, which is unfair. Uh, investors has to go into nine different entities to acquire permissions. Uh, it is a nightmare. The, the World Bank said that we take each take about 634 days to get license. Wow. So sometimes working on that particular system to improve it is not going to give you results. I mean, if you improve from 634 to 500, 500 is still unacceptable. Yeah. So sometimes the best approach is to scrap that system and work on a new complete system. And that's exactly what we've done. Uh, the new system will work on almost 80% of the industries will have the license by notification. So you need to buy me and you will go ahead, you will have the license in less than a month and then we will follow up with you with all the requirements. Number two, everything will be channeled into IDA, which is Industrial Department Authority, to give the entire license. So investors will only deal with one entity. Three, we introduce the consultants or, or approval agency. So it's a private sector offices in order to help you to get civil defense requirement, environmental requirement, or whatever. Uh, we expect that will go from almost six, 600 plus days into less than a month. 20% of the industry will have an approval, will require a pre-approval. So we talked about 80% will have notification, 20% will have pre-approval. You're talking about industries like petrochemicals, like steel, like fertilizers, uh, which will require a specific uh, study to do that. that uh, legislation has been approved by the cabinet and it is in the parliament as we speak. Another example is, is a, a one-person company uh, uh, or individual company that we've already approved a law in the cabinet that individuals can have their own company, individual company, and their liability will be only equal to the capital of that company. Something is not existing which will help dramatically SMEs. Uh, importation registry. Uh, again, this law was, uh, was initiated in 1982, which we have dramatically changed because the world had changed. We've increased the capital. We will require some uh, 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 local uh, dealing before we start to trade from outside. But more importantly, we allow foreigners to import directly because the existing law doesn't allow foreigners to import directly. Although they do, but they have to go through another company, which eventually increases the cost on consumers. Uh, easy trade, so this, those three have been already approved. Uh, a food agency is another very important uh, law. Food agency is even more complicated than investor license. Investor license, we said, in, investors has to go to nine entities. Food agency, 16 entities, because it's spread. Uh, all over the place. So we've already approved in the cabinet the food agency. It's like FDA without the D, obviously. Uh, uh, that agency will deal with everything from end of agriculture to the consumption I, of products. I mean, obviously, the, 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 when you were when you were running Pepsi, you, you were producing a food product, perhaps not the world's most wholesome food product. And I should say Pepsi. Pe absolutely. So you, you had to deal with this. I mean, just just so that people understand. I mean, how does it, how do we get to a position where there are sixteen different entities? It would be hard to devise sixteen ways of splitting the question. That's why we're changing. I'm sure, but I mean, how did it get that way in the first place? Well, you've got so many different laws. You've got different ministers, and each ministry has their own individual uh, uh, control units on manufacturing plant, on supply chain, on traders, uh, and so forth. So, th so the issue was most of the governments didn't want to let go their authority at that time, which is at least in this cabinet. We've already talked it, and uh, we've agreed on the way forward. The law has been approved. So that entity will take all the related uh, uh, food control uh, uh, activities from every ministry, and it will be under the uh, food agency. I mean, that question kind of leads into 
what I want to ask you again a little bit as we talked yesterday with the Ministry of Finance and, and I want you to, to tell us the same story or your version of the same story, the commitment. All of the things that you just talked about, we might have talked about on this stage 10, 12, 15 years ago, essentially. The, the same kinds of problems. There's one difference, major difference. What I said is it had been approved by the cabinet and it is in the parliament as we speak. Okay. So it's not a talk. That's very good. And Thank that's you. what but everybody knew before that these were the problems and they said they were gonna fix them. And you're now saying you have fixed them, or the the the, yes. the, the irrevocable step has been taken. So while it hasn't happened, it is, we can now say clearly it is going to happen. But why didn't it happen before? Why is it, I mean, I'm, I'm not asking you to make a political point, but it's, you know, you, you've run and, and been involved in business in Egypt most of your life. Why did it take so long when these things seem so obvious and clear? Even to the people that are administering sure. them. I mean, I, I cannot comment on, on the past. I mean, what are the priorities at that time? What are the issues, challenges? Every stage has its own challenges. Uh, I cannot comment why it didn't happen. What I can comment and what I can control, where we are and where we're, we're going to. That's what I can compare. Okay. okay. Let's talk about the... Another, another also something, but this is in the pipeline. We're working Minister of Trade and Industry, Minister of Finance, Minister of Transportation on the EG trade is a, a, a complete work in terms of simplifying the process from every for every single product coming in and out of the country. So they include the port, they include the network connections. That will help dramatically improve that flow, will help companies to reduce their, their working capital and so forth. This is in the pipeline. Let's talk about the new SME entity. Tell us a little bit about it, what it's meant to do. Is it financing? Is it advising? Is it facilitating? Um, and of course, part of it feeds through into employment. Part of it also feeds through, I mean, that's the intention, feeds through into greater economic activity in other areas of the country. So if you comment on that as well. Sure. First of all, what is the new entity? Uh, first of all, SME is the backbone of many economies, and including Egypt as well, whether formal or informal. So SMEs, I mean, we'll, we can debate whether it's between 60 to 70 percent of the economy. Uh, big part of it is the informal. Uh, every ministry is working on SMEs, because if you look at the SMEs, there is uh, if you analyze it, there is a small industry SMEs, which is Minister of Industry is working on. There is other SMEs, which is literally every ministry has part of it. Including in my ministry, there is about four or five different entities are working on SMEs, but without a proper leadership uh, or organizing that. The, the new structure is, which is something have been already presented to the uh, uh, to the president and will be discussed hopefully tomorrow in the cabinet if the time allows uh, is we're creating the godfather for SMEs the, the regulator for SMEs that would include dealing with SMEs from A to Z include helping them with a disability study helping them with funding helping them with HR helping them with training and all the way to a startup that include existing or new. Also, we're working on incentive package. Uh, incentive packages to uh, to help the informal to move into formal because the informal is part of the economy. But the reason is they want to move. In order for them to move into formal, they need to see that added value. Well, and and they are naturally by the because of their informality, they are naturally going to be instinctively reluctant to they, talk to a government office. And they, they would will, run in the opposite direction from a government inspector. And they will always be small, as long as it's informal. They will always be limited. The only way to help them 
to be medium and then large is to move into the former. But as you said, they would be reluctant because uh, would we take more taxes from them? Would we start penalizing them and, and, and so forth? So we're looking into a proper incentive uh, package to help them to move from the informal to formal because we cannot help or develop any sector unless we're able to see it. And is, does part of that form some sort of amnesty for whatever is past is past? You said we don't want to comment on the past. Is that an element to it? Yes. Somebody can come to you without, without fear that suddenly he's going to be investigated for something that he did 10 years ago? Of course it is. And that's clear and declared? No. I'm saying we're working on that. Okay. Yes. Okay. The, because a, a critic or somebody inclined to be critical of this type of new entity might say, well, it's just another layer of bureaucracy. You would wish to refute that. Of course. Please do so. Because I'm not creating something from scratch. I'm restructuring and consolidating existing entity to focus on a specific task. I think your point, uh, your point could be valid if we leave everything as is, and then created another unit work. But consolidating the existing or restructuring existing without adding any headcount or without adding any... Because all the activities are there for SME, but they're scattered. So we're putting them under one area. It will be uh, meant to develop that particular sector. Okay. This is, a, we are your money, this is a, a financial conference. Um, we haven't talked about finance and the availability of capital and trade finance and so forth, but clearly without finance, without a financial infrastructure, most of the things, whether it's microfinance for the guy moving from informality to a degree of formality, or whether it's letters of credit for, for, to facilitate trade, do you spend much time thinking about the financial side of, of trade and exports and imports? Of course. I mean, uh, uh Part of creating this entity for SMEs, uh, although we have an arm to uh, help funding, but again, if you look at the central bank, have, for example, uh, had an initiative to uh, uh, for 200 billion pounds to support SMEs, as an example, you know, over four years. But the challenge is today. There's no, again, a single entity to help validate that and help the central bank and, all, and the banks to supply those. This is part of the objective of why we're creating uh, this entity. So financing uh, has obviously two elements. One, foreign components, which we've talked a lot in terms of forex availability. Uh, the Egyptian components, uh, I don't think it's a significant issue as we speak today. Okay, so the, 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 the financing, typical trade finance, is available? More or less, yes. Let's talk about microfinance, because of course that feeds into all these other initiatives sure. as well. Do you have a specific policy on that? We do have a specific policy for finance. Uh, we have uh, the uh, development fund which helps microfinance. Again, that would be part of the, the, the SME's agenda. Very good. But again, the biggest challenge for microfinance is informal employment. And this is something extremely important in order to really boost the sector. In a blue sky, what's the thing? You've been in, the, in this ministry now for how long? One year. One year. By the time you come to complete your second year, what's the thing that you, the single thing that you hope most you will be able to say, we did that? I can't say one thing. It's very, very difficult. I mean, I have important objectives. I have a clear plan for the uh, ministry, which is aligned with the cabinet ministry. ministry. But boosting industry, in general, industry growth, extremely important. And within that specific focus on specific sectors that we have a, a competitive advantage, that's something I'm working quite hard on this. Uh, reducing the trade balance is something extremely 
important. Uh, continue the help on ease in simplifying the business environment for uh, investors to come in. Again, this is a very important thing. So those are, I would say, the three top priority I'm working on. Very good. Well, we wish you all the luck in the world in achieving those. There's clearly massive goodwill Thank towards you. this country, as, as there always has been and always should be. Uh, and congratulations for the job you've done so far. We look forward to talking to you again, maybe before a year is out, but certainly a year from now on this stage. I'll be happy. Thank you very Thank much you so indeed. Much, Mr. Thank Thanks you. very much, sir. So we are still in a Euro Money conference in Egypt and we are interviewing uh, the Mexican ambassador, Mr. Octavio Tripp. Okay, tell me more about the Mexican investment in Egypt. Well, uh, uh, Mexican investors are very interested in uh, increase uh, its investment in this country. And this is why I'm attending this event in order to identify areas of opportunity that exist in, in Egypt because this country is quite relevant not only in Africa but in, in the Middle East and this is why it's very attractive for foreign investors. Could you tell me in which field the investment is growing? Well basically we have presence in the, in, in, in the uh, as a matter of fact one, one of the most important uh, factories that uh, you have here in Egypt is of uh, Mexican origin, CEMEX that is uh, here, but also in the automobile industry is very in interested and in the agro-business. Agro-business is one of the most uh, attractive areas that the Mexican investors are, are looking at here in Egypt. Could you tell me some numbers to get in deep? Well, as a matter of fact, we are organizing a, a future visit of, of uh, Mexican investors to, to Egypt and the Arab uh, Chamber of Commerce in Mexico is organizing this. So uh, I think that the information that I will send related or regarding to this event is going to be very uh, useful in order to identify specific companies that uh, will be coming to Egypt. Um, I want you to tell me um a general overlook about uh, the Egyptian economy in this fiscal year. Uh, excuse me, can you repeat, please? Uh, the Egyptian economy in this year. Uh -huh. Well, uh, the, the, uh, the Egyptian economy is facing uh, uh, important challenges, but at the same time, what we have noticed is that uh, uh, the government is uh, paving the way in order to overcome, in order to solve the problems that, uh, that they have ahead. And, uh, and the best proof uh, to notice this progress is the agreement that uh, uh, this government is promoting with the monetary fo international monetary fund. As an advice, um, how to attract more uh, investors from Mexico and what they need? Well, we need more information, specific information and technical uh, information about Egypt, uh, about uh, the regulation that exists in this, in this country, because we have a lot of potential and frankly speaking, we uh, have an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary opportunities in front of us in order to improve our bilateral relationships. Information is the name of the game. Information the main of the game. Okay, uh, talking about the IMF loan, all of us know about the IMF loan in Egypt. So, uh, do you think how we could push Egypt to success through this loan? Well, I'm not uh, an expert in economic issues and, and, and I'm just arriving to Egypt, but what I have noticed is that uh, uh, the message that this country will be sending to the markets and to the inter uh, international community of investors will be very positive because uh, this agreement uh, will be uh, underlying, will be highlighting the fact that the Egypt is uh, following an orthodox uh, way in order to overcome the present and the current challenges that this country is facing. Uh, in today's conference, Euro Money, we have talked about uh, SMEs. So do you think it will affect uh, positively the Egyptian uh, market? 
I think that SMEs is, are, are crucial not only in Egypt but in all the emerging economies. I can tell you that in Mexico, for instance, it's uh, quite relevant. To, it's crucial, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. to promote this kind of uh, uh, small and, and micro uh, business because uh, gener because they generate a lot of uh, job opportunities. And, and, and this is valid not only for Mexico but for Egypt and, as I told you, for the emerging economies in the world. Thank you so much. The الواردات نزلت حوالي 7 مليار من أول السنة الصادرات زادت بحوالي مليار وفي نفس الوقت الصناعة المصرية ملت الفراغ اللي نتج عن نمو الصادرات. النمو ال ال ال. الوزير الأسبوع المعروف يكلم اللجنة البعثة الفنية اللي هيتم إرسالها أولا هيناشوا فيهم مفاوضات هتدور حوالي. الكلام ده هيحصل يوم 26 في بعثة موجودة من الحجر الزراعي ومن رجال أعمال ومن وزارة التجارة والصناعة. وان شاء الله هي هي حل المشكله هل فعلا في مخالفات على الصادرات الزراعيه المصريه لا احنا اعلنا ده امبارح بالنسبه لروسيا احنا عايزين نشوف ايه المشاكل بتاعتهم احنا لسه ما بلغناش رسمي بالنسبه لامريكا احنا كان في كلام عن الموضوع ده كتير بصينا على اتكلمنا معاهم وفي الاف دي اي ريبورت الاف دي اي ريبورت لو بصينا عليه يمكن من ثلاث سنين حوالي 300 انذار لشركه منهم ثلاث شركات مصريه الكلام ده من ثلاث سنين السنه دي في شركه واحده فقط فما فيش مشكلة كبيرة يعني في الموضوع. يعني ما خطاب رسمي جه من الجانب الروسي المصري؟ آه لا جه خطاب للحجر الصحي ببعض المشاكل وطلب الاجتماع وعشان كده اللجنة هتروح. استراتيجية صناعة السيارات اللي حضرتك طلعت بيها حضرتك قلتها امبارح استراتيجية يا فندم في البرلمان. حضرتك يعني اعلنت النهارده عن خطة طموحة لتضييعين الصناعة المصرية، الخطوات المستقبلية يا فندم. ده اللي احنا شغالين عليه، شغالين في تعميق الصناعة المصرية، شغالين في من من خلال تدعيم او قفل السبلاي تشين الفراغات اللي موجوده في في سبيسيفيك سيكتورز مركزين على الصادرات طبعا. مع الوزير حضرتك اتكلمت عن دعم الفلاح مباشره دون ان دعم الشركات يعني كيف يتم خلال الفتره المقبله؟ ده بيتم حاليا من وزاره الزراعه. هي بتشتري بسعر وبتدي على الفلاح بسعر. ان الجيل المصري ايفنشلي هيبقى فري فلوتنج حضرتك كنت انا ما قلتش كده. لا انا قلت بالظبط كده اهو زي ما قال يعني في النهايه لازم هيحصل في وقت من الاوقات البنك المركزي هو اللي بيتعامل بيه الوقت ازاي ويحصل ازاي دي قرار بنك مركزي. بالنسبه لصناعه السيارات في المستقبل معانا وزير كيف تنظر الصناعه بشكل عام خلال الفتره اللي جايه؟ تحسين الصناعه بشكل عام حاجة من الحاجات المهمة جدا ان احنا بننشئ جهاز او هيئة لتنمية المشروعات الصغيرة المتوسطة دي هتشمل كل الجهات المعنية اللي بتنشئ طبعا الصناعة الصغيرة المتوسطة حوالي 70% في المية سبعين في المية من ممكن اكمل؟ سبعين في المية من الصناعة المصرية ده هيبقى من اول مساعدتهم في دراسه الجدوى الى التمويل الى التدريب الى كل ده جزء كبير جدا من النمو بهذه الصناعه. معالي الوزير حضرتك اشرت الى العديد حضرتك اشرت اليوم الى العديد من المشروعات القوميه منها قناه السويس وغير ذلك من المشروعات العملاقه، يعني التفاصيل من حضرتك. المشروعات القوميه مشروعات مهمه جدا للاستثمار يعني لو تاخدي بالك احنا في خلال الخمس سنين اللي فاتوا ما نفذناش مشروعات كتيرة ودي مؤثرة على الاستثمار من وقت انتخاب السيد الرئيس عبد الفتاح ركزنا على المشروعات القومية بنتكلم على محور قناة السويس اللي هيكون داعم كبير للاستثمار طبعا دبلنج قناة السويس 5000 كيلو متر من الطرق دي حاجة مهمة جدا من ساعة التنمية وهيوصلوا ل 7000 قريب بنتكلم على بنى ثلاث مدن في المرحلة القليلة زودنا يمكن بعد سنه هنبقى يمكن تقريبا 50% من الكهرباء اللي اتبنت في مصر من تاريخها مفيش استثمار هيجي ومفيش كهرباء ودي حاجات من الحاجات المهمه جدا. مع ان وزير التجاره مع ان وزير التجاره على وجه التحديد وقت الوقت هيروح يوم 26 او يوم 26 هيبقى في اجتماع ان شاء الله في مصر اتكلمت عن مؤازمات صناعه السيارات في المستقبل كيف ترى ذلك؟ ما هي استراتيجيه اتعملت توافق عليها من مجلس الوزراء وحاليا في البرلمان.
نتمنى لكم تغطيه خاصه وحصريه يا رب تكونوا استمتعتوا واستنونا في حلقه جديده